bringing the four track Tascam Cassette Porta Studio into a real studio again, but this time I'm not alone. Here we go. After the first video where I brought this Tascam 4 track over to the Pencil Factory Recording Studio, many of you in the comments asked me to bring it back there. And let me tell you, after a year of making videos all by myself, I was all too eager to get friends in on this one. So what are we doing today? We're recording real live musicians onto a cassette Porta studio from 1987. How will we do it? Very carefully. I'm just kidding, we're gonna get into the details of the recording, but first... Band intro and microphones. Uh, and let me introduce you to my collaborators today. Very grateful to have on the guitar, Colin Stanley himself. Hi. Plays a riff. Oh. <laughs> oh, guitar's off. Oh. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> on the drums today, we're collaborating with Mr. John Horn. Hey, yo. Hey, give us a riff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about uh, signal flow miking setup real quick. Oh, drum overhead. My favorite tube mic, the Vanguard V13. Down here on the kick drum, Aston Origin mic. And we've got the Shure 52 on the inside. This is the secret that no one will tell you. Snare top and snare bottom. A 57 and a 57. No one has ever done it. I've never heard anyone say it before. <laughs> Over here on the guitar, that is a Shure KSM, KSM8. Uh, that is an AKG 414, uh, and we're combining we're combining those signal into the Midas. But I'm going to show you the routing in the Midas uh, coming up in a second. Signal flow. All right, here we are at the board, and I'm going to just walk through real quick what uh, what mics are going where. So, Colin Colin's guitar amp. The first channel is the KSM8. And then the second channel is the 414. And so those are both being grouped over here. We only have four groups on this mixer, which is convenient because the four track has four tracks. So that's, that's math or arithmetic. And guitars are being summed into group one. Group one is being sent into this Neve style preamp. And that Neve style preamp is going to this compressor. <laughs> kick drum signal. The two kick drum mics are going into group two, and that's going straight into a uh, light, lightly compressed, barely any on that one. Snare top and snare bottom are channels five and six. Five and six are being summed into group three. You can see where this is probably going. That's going to a compressor down here. Same style. And Mr. John Horn helped dial in that one. Last, last but not least, the mono overhead. My favorite microphone coming out of a group, because that's how I have things routed. And that's going into this Neve style preamp. And you can see the EQ we did there. Pretty simple. If you have any questions, uh, hit me up in the comments below. Does this all make sense so far? Essentially, I'm using the power of analog summing on the mixer at the pencil factory to combine microphones into one signal path. That way, two snare mics or two guitar mics or, or two kick drum mics will only take up one channel on the cassette Porta Studio. Good? Now let's talk about the snare issue. Whether it's your first time recording or your 10,000th, little problems always seem to pop up during a recording session. You must be able to diagnose and fix them quickly. The number one rule of audio is something's gonna go wrong, just be prepared to fix it. You're an electron plumber. Considering that our main focus was simply to record live musicians on the Tascam for the first time, the session was going very smoothly until this point in the sound check. Whoa. Never heard that before. What do you mean? That snare sounded okay, right? Wrong. You were just hearing the live microphone or the live snare sound. Let me play you what was going on inside my headphones in that moment. <laughs> this was a problem. 
Are you going to do the explanation of what what the digital issue was with the snare in post? Is that something you'd rather say for No, I'll, I'll do that right now. Okay, I'll do okay. that right. So he literally just flipped these two buttons and that fixed the problem. John gives a great explanation as to what was happening there. The signal was being caught in a loop. It hits the mic. The mic feeds to the mic box. Mic box goes into the mic pre on the back side of the console. Turn up the mic gain. It goes through the EQ section, then it hits the, the fader, and then it comes back up to the aux ends or the groups and whatever. And then uh, when the tape machine comes back, it's got to go somewhere, right? Well, we use the board to route that as well. Trouble is, uh, the previous user left that button in, and so when it came back from the tape machine, it hit the whole structure again, came down the mice, hits the, the fader, comes back up. It goes, oh, I go back to that bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Blink. I guess I'll make the loop again. Uh, it was sounding kind of whacked out because it was also going through the compressor. So once that was fixed and levels were all set, Colin and John laid down three takes onto cassette. So let's hear it. The sound of cassette. John hits the drums hard. I should mention now that this music is actually a small excerpt of one of Colin's songs. It's called Time Future. We figured it'd be a cool track to kind of like reimagine on the tape machine because this is actually the studio uh, we recorded it in. Go check out the artist, Colin Stanley. Links in the description below. So, I happen to have the session right here. <laughs> happen to have, I mean, I recorded it. I have the session with me right here in the Tascam. And next, I'm going to show you each track soloed so you can hear what we were hearing to build that sound that you just heard from this cassette. Track one is where Colin's two guitar amps, two guitar amps, two guitar mics, we're uh, going into. So let's hear Colin's guitar soloed. <laughs> You know what uh, is very interesting to me about this track? That amp and the mics were in the same room as the drums. And did you hear any m drum bleed into that? I mean, maybe you could barely hear it. How did I do that? Well, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the engineer producer Vance Powell. He's one of my favorite uh, he's worked on many of my favorite records. I'm a big Jack White fan. I'm from the Detroit area. So is Colin and we love that sound. But one of the things he's always mentioned when he records live bands, line up the amps uh, with the kick drum as if you're, they're playing on stage. And I personally don't have a ton of experience recording live bands, or at least whenever I have, we've always isolated the amplifiers. So I thought, hey, let's um, embrace the vibe of the cassette and just throw them in together. And I'm shocked at how that technique worked so well. It worked very, very well. Uh, you'll notice how that amplifier was set up in line with the drums. It's a small room, and I think that technique supposedly is more often used in a bigger room, but hey, work with what you got. Moving on to track two, which is the kick drum. There were two kick drum mics, and they both ended up summed together here. You can already see my EQ situation. So let me flatten those out, just so you can hear that soloed. What, is that the kick drum mic? I really, really like to use large diaphragm condensers to get a nice, uh, a beefier bass drum sound. Obviously this picked up a ton of cymbal bleed, but listen again when I play that back and roll back the highs on the Tascam. Definitely a little crunchy. I was really impressed at how well that 10K shelf works. The Tascam EQ is very simple. It says high and low, but what it is is the low is a shelf at 100 hertz. And when you turn it in either direction, that does bring up frequencies below 100, but if you crank it enough, it'll, it creeps into the low mids. And so it's the same with the highs. 
but you pull it down. I don't know what the actual measurement here is at this point, but you're getting some of that harsh cymbal bleed out. Anyway, let's listen to that snare drum. Pretty cool. There's still some cymbal bleed in there, but who cares? Uh, we already went over the snare issue. The other thing to always keep in mind when you're using a top mic and a bottom mic on a drum, it's important to flip the polarity on the bottom mic, and that has to do with the sound pressure wave. Smarter people have explained it to me. I take their word for it. Last but not least, let's listen to those overheads solo. Mono overhead. I just have a tendency to just say those overheads, even though it's one. That overhead mic has a, uh, I would call a very smooth sound, and I would definitely attribute that to the wonderful folks at Vanguard Audio Labs, that V13 tube condenser that they make. Guys, take my word for it, that is a very good microphone for its price point. So good job, Vanguard Audio Labs. So regarding that overhead mic, another friend was with us. Also today helping me out in the studio is Mr. James Quesada. Wow! James asked me a really great question. Why do you prefer to go in the mono overhead? And here is my long-winded answer. My favorite music uh, is from an era where it was mono drums. Yeah, the drums come from one place. But yeah, I mean, when I'm listening to drums, I'm and I'm standing here, one source of it's coming at me. Well, it, it's technically a couple of sources. Yeah, but when I'm, when I'm this far <laughs> away. To, yeah, yeah, and obviously the practical, on a four track machine, you're limited to the amount of tracks. And here was Colin's better answer. One of the advantages of doing mono is there's less phase issues when you're taking the tracks away too. So it's simpler, especially in the setup we have going on today. Wise words, thoughts, and recording bass. There you have it. I actually have friends. Remember, that's the first time I've ever recorded a band, and we kind of just threw the mics up and played and called it a night. We didn't spend a ton of time fiddling around. I had to cut a lot of footage from this uh, just to make it YouTube consumable. One thing I cut was when I threw on the subwoofers in the room and caught John off guard by how intense the low end could be out of this Tascam. Very, very cool. Very excited to work more in the future with other people. And again, let me know if that's something that interests you, the viewer, the people watching. Comment below and do all that YouTube stuff. Now, the original version of this song, which is out on Spotify and all the other streaming platforms, had bass. And funny enough, I was the bassist on that session. Go figure. Uh, I'm going to do an external bounce of these four tracks and I'll bring the stereo track back into the task cam and I'm gonna play the bass. Stick around to hear that. But otherwise, with that as always, peace and be good to each other. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a stick break. That's how you know this is rock and roll. That's how you know it's rock and roll, baby. You gotta break them sticks. <laughs>